a million rabbits, desert, one year, complete ecological transformation that nobody saw coming. Sounds like the setup to a really weird joke, right? Except this actually happened. And the punchline is that these fluffy little creatures accidentally solved a problem that billions of dollars and decades of engineering couldn't fix. Keep watching and find out how China's most adorable environmental disaster became its most unexpected success story. Here's the thing about deserts. They're supposed to stay deserts. That's kind of their whole deal. But China had other plans. The Kubuchi Desert in Inner Mongolia was growing fast, about 67 square miles every single year. That's roughly the size of Washington, D.C. just turning into sand. Annually, the desert was eating farmland swallowing villages, and generally being a massive sandy menace to about 400,000 people trying to live near it. Beijing was getting nervous. The capital sits only 500 miles southeast of Kubuchi. On windy days, the city would wake up covered in yellow dust. Your car? Sandy? Your apartment? Sandy? That sandwich you're eating? Surprise? Extra crunch. So in the 1990s, China did what China does best. They threw everything at the problem. Trees, mostly, millions and millions of trees. The government launched massive reforestation campaigns. They planted and planted some more. They even banned grazing in certain areas, paid farmers to plant instead of farm. And you know what happened? The trees died. Anyway, turns out, and this will shock you, trees don't love being planted in deserts. The survival rate was abysmal. We're talking maybe 15% in good years. The sand was too dry, too salty, too hostile. The desert didn't care about China's ambitious plans. It just kept being a desert. But here's where it gets interesting. Someone had an idea, a weird idea, an idea that probably got them laughed out of several meetings before anyone took it seriously. What if we used rabbits? Not to plant trees, obviously. Rabbits are many things, but arborists they are not. The idea was different. Rabbits would graze on the sparse desert vegetation. Their burrows would aerate the sand. And most importantly, they'd eat the few plants that were actually thriving in the desert, the ones that nobody wanted. See, the Kubuchi Desert isn't completely barren. There's a plant called Artemisia ordosica, desert wormwood, if you want to get fancy about it. This stuff is basically the cockroach of the plant world. It survives anywhere, grows fast, spreads aggressively and it's completely useless for grazing animals. Sheep won't touch it. Goats turn their noses up at it. Even camels, who eat literal thorns, would rather skip lunch. But rabbits. Rabbits will eat anything. They're like the garbage disposals of the mammal world. And they thought, they actually thought, that Artemisia was delicious. So in 2002, the local government started a pilot program. They relocated several thousand rabbits into a controlled section of the desert dug holes, multiplied, because that's what rabbits do best. The results were interesting enough that by 2003, they scaled up, way up. Over the next few years, they relocated more than a million rabbits into the Kubuchi Desert, one million fluffy ecological engineers with a taste for desert weeds and an impressive reproductive rate. Now, if you know anything about rabbits, you're probably thinking this sounds like an ecological disaster waiting to happen. And honestly, Fair. Australia's rabbit problem is legendary. In the 1850s, someone released 24 rabbits for hunting. By the 1920s, there were an estimated 10 billion rabbits destroying the continent. They ate everything, caused erosion, drove species extinct. It was a catastrophe with floppy ears. So what made China think this would be different? Actually, they didn't. Not really. This was a calculated risk born from desperation. The desert was advancing regardless. The tree planting wasn't working. Something had to change. And there were a few key differences from the Australian situation. First, these weren't European rabbits. They were using local breeds, primarily the Inner Mongolia rabbit, which was already adapted to the harsh conditions. They understood the predators. They knew the climate. They belonged there, technically. Second, the Kubuchi Desert despite growing, still had predators. Foxes, eagles, wolves, in some areas. Australia's rabbit problem exploded partly because there were no natural predators. Here, there was at least some population control built into the ecosystem. Third, 
And this is crucial. The rabbits weren't there to terraform the desert into grassland. That's not what anyone wanted. The goal was much more modest. Slow the desert's expansion. Stabilize the sand. Create conditions where other intervention methods might actually work. But here's what nobody expected. The rabbits worked. Like really worked. Within the first year, researchers noticed changes. The rabbits were eating it faster than it could grow. And all that rabbit poop? Pure nitrogen-rich fertilizer. The sand was getting less sandy, more soil-like. Organic matter was increasing. The burrows were doing something unexpected, too. When rabbits dig, they bring up subsurface material. Mix it with the surface. Their tunnels create channels for water to penetrate deeper into the ground instead of evaporating immediately. Basically, a million rabbits were tilling the soil without even meaning to. Then the really weird stuff started happening. Plants that hadn't been seen in the area for decades began showing up. Seeds that had been dormant in the sand, waiting for the right conditions, suddenly found those conditions. The rabbit-modified soil could support them. Scientists started documenting species they hadn't expected to see for another 20 years of restoration work. By year two, areas with heavy rabbit populations showed 40% more plant diversity than control areas. 40%. From rabbits just living their best lives. The stabilized vegetation meant the sand stopped moving as much. Less erosion. Less of that yellow dust making its way to Beijing. Local farmers started reporting that the sandstorms were less frequent. Less intense. They could actually see a difference. But wait. There's more. Because this is where the story gets properly interesting. The increased vegetation attracted insects. The insects attracted birds. The birds brought more seeds in their droppings. Those seeds grew into more plants. More plants meant more rabbits could survive. More rabbits meant more soil improvement. It was a positive feedback loop. The kind that ecologists dream about but rarely see in practice. Within five years, sections of the Kubuchi Desert that had been lifeless sand dunes were covered in scrub vegetation. Not forests, not lush grasslands, but actual living ground cover that held the soil in place. The desert was still a desert, but it was a stable desert. It wasn't eating farmland anymore. The tree planting programs that had failed miserably before, they started working because the rabbits had done the groundwork. Literally, the improved soil could support saplings. The reduced sand movement meant young trees weren't getting buried. Survival rates jumped from 15% to over 60% in rabbit-modified areas. Local herders started bringing their sheep back. Not to the most heavily rabbit-populated zones, but to the edges. The vegetation could support controlled grazing again. Communities that had abandoned their homes were returning. The economic impact was enormous. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in restored agricultural land. By 2010, over 2,300 square miles of the Kubuchi Desert had been stabilized. That's an area larger than Delaware. The desert was still there, but it had stopped growing. For the first time in centuries, it was actually shrinking. International researchers started paying attention. The Chinese Academy of Sciences published papers. The United Nations Environment Program took notice. This wasn't supposed to work. Introducing a large population of mammals into a fragile ecosystem should have been a disaster, but it wasn't. It was working. It's not even trying to be. The rabbit population has had to be managed. They did overpopulate. Had to be culled or relocated. There were failures. Sections where the rabbits didn't take or where they ate everything and then starved. It wasn't a magical fix everything situation, but here's what it was. It was an example of working with nature instead of against it. The tree planting campaigns were trying to force European style forestry onto a desert. It was expensive, energy intensive, and mostly ineffective. The rabbits were just being rabbits, doing what they naturally do. And in doing so, they created the conditions for everything else to work. The approach has been studied and adapted for other desertification projects. Not just in China, Mongolia has experimented with similar programs. Parts of the Middle East are looking into it. It's cheap. Rabbits breed themselves. They maintain themselves. You don't need massive government programs or billions in funding. You just need rabbits and patience. There's something almost poetic about it. One of humanity's oldest domesticated animals, solving a problem created by industrial agriculture and climate change. We tried engineering. We tried brute force. 
and then we tried rabbits. The Kubuchi Desert Project has become a model for ecological restoration, not because it's high-tech or innovative in the traditional sense, but because it's sustainable, it's scalable, and most importantly, it actually works. Today, over 6,000 square miles of the Kubuchi Desert have been greened. That's about one-third of the entire desert. The remaining two-thirds are stable, not expanding. Tourism has developed in the area. People take desert safaris to see the transformation. There are ecological museums, research stations. The desert that was a problem is now an attraction. Local farmers have diversified. Some raise rabbits commercially now. Rabbit meat is popular in Chinese cuisine. The fur is valuable. What started as an ecological intervention became an economic opportunity. Communities that were struggling are now thriving. The rabbit population has stabilized too. Natural predators have returned in higher numbers. The ecosystem has found a balance. There are probably still over a million rabbits in the Kubuchi Desert, but they're spread out, integrated, part of the environment rather than an invasive force. Climate scientists point to Kubuchi as evidence that desertification can be reversed. That's huge. About one third of Earth's land surface is at risk of becoming desert. If the rabbit method can be adapted and applied elsewhere, we're talking about potentially saving millions of square miles of land. But here's the really important lesson. Sometimes the best solutions aren't the most obvious ones. China spent decades and billions of dollars on conventional restoration. It barely made a dent. Then someone suggested rabbits and got laughed at. But they tried it anyway. And those fluffy little chaos agents succeeded where engineering failed. It's a reminder that nature is smarter than we are. Ecosystems are complex. They have feedback loops and relationships that we don't fully understand. Sometimes the best approach is to introduce the right catalyst and let the system fix itself. The million rabbits didn't terraform the desert. They didn't turn it into farmland or forest. They just stabilized it, made it livable, created conditions for other life to return. And that was enough. That was more than enough. So yeah, a million rabbits, a desert, one year, and a transformation that shocked the world. Not because it was impossible, but because it was so simple. Sometimes the answer to a massive problem isn't a massive solution. Sometimes it's just rabbits. Lots and lots of rabbits. If you want to see more stories about unexpected solutions to impossible problems, hit that subscribe button and let us know in the comments what you think about this. Would you have suggested rabbits or would you have been one of the people laughing them out of the meeting?